Hi, my name is Robin Singer, writer and creator of Final Gamble. My social is Robin L. Singer on Instagram, and you're watching Two Geese Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented uh, comic writer and creator of an amazing comic called Final Gamble. She is, of course, the ever-talented Robin L. Singer. How are you doing today? Hi there, everyone. Uh, I'm doing good. Thank you. Wonderful. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My work is very much inspired by two things, I could say. I take things in the real world that greatly frustrate me, that disturb me, and I blend them with things that I just find cool. I freely admit I'm kind of a dork. I blend these dorky concepts with the things and I talk about the things that upset me through those lenses, as was you can probably tell from the pronouns that were used to describe me. I am a trans woman. <laughs> and as such, it has always been very important to me to show great diversity in my work. And I believe that shines through in Final Gamble. So then what is Final Gamble? Final Gamble is a thriller inspired by Japanese gambling manga, specifically the works of Nobuyuki Fukumoto. And it follows a gambling addict and a disgraced MMA fighter after failing to pay off their debts end up becoming essentially the prisoners of an elite rich society forced to play their games if they're going to have any chance of survival. So then what are some misunderstood aspects about yourself as a, as a creative person when you say that you're a comic creator and writer? Well, I am definitely more than a comic creator. My background is in film. I went to college, have a degree in playwriting and screenwriting with a minor in film. I have had several short stories published. Those are that are prose, non-comics. And I have my debut novel coming out this November from Cinema Moth Publishing. And what's the novel? The novel is called The Sunrisers. It is the first in a trilogy. And it is a autistic lesbian space opera that I can basically describe as killing Eve in space, but without the awful ending. That's usually the worst when you're so invested in a series and the ending just falls flat. Literally the last two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Being as you're multi-talented in many different areas and fields, what's more creative for you? Is it script writing for a film or is it script writing for a, a novel or for a comic? I think I'm most comfortable writing a novel. It's because I've got, I've written several novels at this point. Not all of them are getting published, but that's the way the industry works. As far as comics goes, though, there's definitely a fulfilling aspect to them. You don't get in the others uh, where you know, the process isn't done after you write your first, second, or even third draft of the script because you're still working with your artist. You're still working with your letterer to make the final product as good as possible. And then for Final Gamble itself, you have a variety of amazingly talented people as part of your team as well, too. Can you tell us who some of those people are and how you found them? My penciler and inker is Jorge Santiago Jr. He is the best known as the penciler and inker for the hit indie comic Spencer and Locke, written by David Pepos. Mm -hmm. It is actually my favorite indie comic of all time. And when I was writing Final Gamble, I specifically had it in mind for Jorge to draw it. I thought his style was the only one that could truly bring my vision to life. Fortunately, Jorge and I had, were, we weren't friends, but we were familiar with each other because I was constantly praising his work. <laughs> so when I emailed him and shot him the premise, he was super into it. He's a fan of Fukumoto's work as well. I'm partial to the manga Kaiji. He's partial to Akagi. But we were both able to come together. I got him on board. The colorist is Harry Saxon, best known and probably for Vagrant Queen. Mm -hmm. Him, I found while going through Twitter on Portfolio Day looking for diverse talent. And finally, my letterer, George Gant, best known as the creator of the hit web comic, Beware of Toddler, which yeah. you should really all read. It's amazing. I would actually worked with him on a previous project. And so when I was working on this, I thought, yeah, definitely bring him back. I've had George on the show a couple of times, actually. He's a longtime friend as well. And he's, oh, he's nice. a, just an amazingly talented person uh, to boot. And you know, I've had David Pepos as well on for uh, talking about Spencer Locke and, and Oz as well, too. So I love to have Rory on the on the show to talk about his his artistic style to it. So 
you have some very talented people working with you, and I'm glad that they're making Final Gamble a, a realization. Same. It would not be half as good as it is without them. So then how did uh, Final Gamble come into the publishing of Band of Bark? The joke answer I always give is that it's because Image Comics said no. <laughs> More seriously, that did actually happen. I did originally submit to Image along with several other publishers. But one day as I was starting to lose hope, I see on my Twitter this new publisher gets it's gotten retweeted by an artist. I read through their philosophy and statements. They seem pretty cool. Like, okay, sure, let's give this a shot. Probably won't go anywhere, but why not? So I submit my comic, and a few days later, I hear back, and hey, they're interested. Oh, ah! So then what does Band of Bards do for you as, as a creative person in terms of getting your book published? How does that help you uh, not only creatively, but from a, a mindset of maybe future works with them? Band of Bards has been absolutely instrumental. They ran the Kickstarter that got the book funded. That was all them. They have promoted the book like crazy. They have expanded the book's reach. And just recently, they got the book distribution with Diamond, which mm -hmm. I don't think I ever would have been able to do on my own. What is your creative kryptonite? Um, if I had to pick a weakness, it would be my anxiety, which goes for life in general, as well as my writing. In the moment when I'm writing, I'll think something's a really good idea, and I'll write it down, and I'll put it in the story, but, and I'll think I did as best as I could, but... Like a week or so later, I'll be watching a TV show or a movie. I'll see something similar that I think, oh, they did that better. <laughs> and suddenly I'll think, okay, I have to go back to the script and rewrite that bit to make it more like that. As a writer, what is the hardest part about your process? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end? I do not start a work before I have a complete outline. And that outline will have a detailed beginning, a detailed end, and a vague enough middle where I know what's got to happen, but also I have enough room to play around with that. And of those categories, that middle is definitely the hardest for me because it's the only part that I don't have full control over from the start. But also I like it that way because, yes, it's more challenging, but I like having that freedom to change things as I go. In your opinion, what's the most important quality of a writer in, in today's entertainment and mass media that gets consumed on a bisecond basis? The unfortunate, honest answer is knowing how to play the game. Skill is secondary in the end, and knowing it's all about who you know, what, what you say online, whose attention you get. I hate that this is the reality, but I really do think that comics and being successful in them is not about um, how good you are as a writer or even how good you are as an artist, but just uh, how good you are at networking. How good are you at networking? Probably better than I think, not as good as I like. As a writer, what was the first thing that you created where you thought, yes, I could do this professionally? My first bit of serious writing was a web serial I started when I was uh, 16. I'd just been reading this web serial that's basically the definitive web serial, web serial for anyone in that community, uh, Worm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hey, I could do something like that. And so uh, I ended up writing it. It lasted 100 chapters. Looking back on it, the original is the first few chapters are unreadable garbage. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the end, I would say it got to a passable level, barely. But people enjoyed it. People liked that. It was really writing that, even if it wasn't good, that made me decide to pursue writing in college. Was there anyone in, in college that kind of guided you on your creative writing path? I'd say the best writing instructor I had in college was my now late professor, Imani Douglas. Uh, she was absolutely incredible. She taught me a lot. She uh, mentored me through my senior project. And I hope she's resting in peace. So what was the hardest scene for you to write in Final Gamble? Well, she was the only one out so far. I don't want to give spoilers. Uh, I also don't think any part of it was hard for me. I had the idea for Final Gamble. And I proceeded to binge read and watch basically every gambling anime and manga ever made as for preparation and research. And so with all that going through my brain, all that energy, all those ideas... Uh, I basically cranked out that first issue in two days. Oh, wow. So then which gambling anime and manga is the most underrated that you research? Well, most underrated. I'm going to go with One Outs. One Outs is the story of 
a pitcher who gets signed to a professional baseball team that's been failing for years with a unique contract. For every batter he strikes out, he gets a million dollars. For every run he gives up, though, he owes thirty million, and so this results in him, him having to constantly strategize not just how to get people out, but how to make maximize his profit. So, then looking at the scripts that you created, when you finally got the art back, what was your favorite scene that you were like, "Wow, this turned out way better in art form than I, I have on the page." I think the part that really uh, was most amplified by the art was definitely the fantasy sequence that are used to represent the fears and anxieties of the characters. Jorge really amplified what I had down on the page there to create something truly nightmarish and creepy, and I really dug that. How many unpublished or unfinished scripts do you have currently? So I currently already have eight issues of Final Gamble written. I have written four novels. I have written pilots for multiple TV shows. And I still have several short stories which are being published that have not been published yet. Out of the ones that are maybe half written, how many of those do you have? Only one. Generally, when I start a project, I finish up. Oh, nice. So what's the keys to your success to finishing the projects that you have currently on your plate? Obsessive compulsion. Uh, when I'm writing a story, it's all I can think about and it takes over my life. <laughs> sometimes good, sometimes bad. Yeah. Yeah, but when you're in a zone, you kind of want to stay in that zone to complete something. I completely understand. Mm -hmm. Do you think someone it could be a, a good writer if they don't really feel emotions? Yes. I. So long as you understand human emotions, you don't need to feel them yourself to be a good writer. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? First thing that instantly comes into my mind, I was a kid and my, um, I was with my older brother, mom and dad were getting out of the car. And I, I don't remember what we were doing. It was something stupid, but my brother and I were messing around. And as we park and get out, mom says, I don't love you. If you could tell your younger self something, one, one thing, what would that be? Okay, because the obvious is, hey, listen, it's personal. It'd be, hey, listen, kid, you're an egg, you're a woman, embrace that now. You'll be save yourself a whole lot of headaches. <laughs> Creatively, I tell them what, more about what I, them, what I was talking about earlier, network. Like, it's not going to matter how good you are, how, how much better you are than everyone else if you don't know the right people. So start making connections early. So for those that have actually gotten to read Final Gamble and, and have given their feedback, what have you learned from, from their feedback from a, a, a published author that you are? Apparently I'm flawless because I haven't had one person give me a critique. <laughs> well, what have people been saying about it then? I think it's really original. It raises a lot of questions, has them on the edge of their seat, makes them want to know more. And yeah, this first issue is not a complete story on its own. It's not, it doesn't suck you into the world immediately. It's, the first issue is set up. It raises questions. And the fact that people are curious about the answers is all I need. So then what are some of the themes that you wrote about that spoke to you as you were creating this story? The main themes of Final Gamble are addiction, wealth, corruption, and um, will willpower. Um, some of those are more prominent in the first arc, some of those more prominent in the second arc. I mentioned at the start that when I'm writing, I like to take something I find cool and mix it with something that frustrates me. And so with this, I took, hey, taking gambling and making it like this action-packed thriller and mixing it with the utter disgustingness that is late stage capitalism and the gratuitous wealth of billionaires. And uh, yes, I did write all of this before anyone knew what a squid game was. Uh, was it during the billionaire space race? <laughs> Especially those themes. I mean, they, they must have really affected your writing to, to, be so, to feel so strongly to write about them. Like, like how did they affect your writing like, to this extent? Let's be real here. Writers ain't rich for the most part, unless you're Steven Spielberg. And uh, we're, we're just trying to get by, trying to make, do our best. And then people richer than God flying into space, spending millions of dollars just for to do, do a roundabout. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, eat the ratch, everyone, eat the ratch. Good thing you didn't write about NFTs or anything like that. Oh, no. Uh, if you make NFTs, please do not read Final Gamble. I do not want you. <laughs> At what point are we good enough? 
in general, as a PS people, I'd say we are good enough when we've reached a point in life when we're no longer unsatisfied. Like we're always, as people, we're always going to be striving for more. Humans need work to live. We need something to achieve. But the feeling of accomplishment from what you've done, I think that's when it's satisfied. What is one mistake that you'll never do again? I'm never going to put a creator on a pedestal again. They always disappoint, you know. What is one experience that everyone should have before they die? Okay, listen, I'm 23. I'm not the person to be asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a pretty large uh, question, so I, yeah. I can understand I'm that. Not, I'm, not, I'm like a fifth through my life, hopefully, so I don't know. What could we pay more more attention to? Pay more attention to the people around you. Do what you can to look after them because when people in your life are in pain or they go away, you're the one who gets hurt too. And for your sake and theirs, look after them. Look after the people you care about always. So if you could have dinner or drinks or whatever with one person alive or dead, who would that be and why? I'm going to go with Jesus. Take a whole bunch of pictures and get rich off those. Does a, an ego help or hurt a writer? A writer needs a healthy ego, but I also think, especially in the comic space, I understand the need to try and remind yourself that, that fan culture can be toxic because, yes, a lot of comic fan culture is toxic and you need to take care of yourself. But also I feel like a lot of comic creators, especially more popular ones, have such massive egos nowadays to the point where they refuse to take any valid criticism and would sooner insult their readers than listen to any of that. Definitely, I think a healthy ego is a good thing, but in comics especially, it can go too far. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? It's a mistake to put creators on a pedestal and that is a mistake I have learned personally. The creator, the writer who most inspired me growing up turned out to be a not good person, a very bad person, in fact. Uh, I'll keep them nameless, but the fact is their work inspired me. They got me into the idea of writing and telling my own stories and emo being emotionally gripping with these characters. And so that was a huge disappointment when they showed their true colors. Uh, outside of him... I've always been more inspired by fictional characters than real people for the most part, to the point where in middle and high school, I had something of a hero complex, wherein if I saw someone getting bullied, either verbally or physically, I felt the need to jump in and do something, protect them. Only lost one fight, and it was to a guy on steroids. From a professional perspective, you are published not only from a prose perspective, but also now through Band of Bards with a comic book as well, too. And you have many other works that are published and will be published in the future as well, too. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do not consider myself personally successful because I have not achieved what I set out to do. I am immensely proud of my work with both Band of Bards and Cinnabar Moth. I am proud of all the writing I've done in general. But as far as being a success, no, I have not done uh, yet done what I set out to do. Since I was little, I have fantasized about being rich, famous, successful. And I think everyone had does. I think anyone who says they aren't is lying to you. <laughs> Um, so, and I know it's a bit hypocritical with what I write about. I write about these evil, rich monsters, and ah, they are yes, they are awful. But we all want that comfort, that safety net, that praise, and especially as a writer, you want lots and lots of people to be reading and appreciating your work. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I struggle from mental illness. I suffer from both depression and anxiety. I have been taught many coping mechanisms to deal with the, with these. My uh, favorite being alternative nostril breathing. And so I often use that when faced with failure. But a lot of the time, I admit, I'm just too punched in the gut, too beaten up, too mentally worn out to do anything. And I just have to collapse in bed and sleep it off. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a, a writer or a creative person in some way, shape or form, whatever that may be. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? 
Well, first off, kids, you should not be reading Final Gamble. Parents, do not let your kids be writing fa- Final reading Final Gamble. This is not a book for younger readers in the slightest. <laughs> as far as it being in general goes, every generation is more progressive than the last. Every generation is more creative and open-minded than the last. And I think that really they just have to see what we're doing and find all the ways we, they can improve. See what we're doing wrong. See what we're not doing good enough. And just be better. Rise above. If your life was a movie or a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Okay, so first off, shout out to all my fellow writers who suck at titles. <laughs> um, second, um, I think I'd call it R over B because, as you can all see, my name is Robin. But it wasn't always. I do have a dead name. And I think that going from that old identity I had to my true self is the most co- key part of my life, my story. And so that's what I want to uh, get the title from. And as far as the soundtrack goes, probably they might be Giants and Jonathan Colton. If I had to go with the third choice for me, I'd go with Garfunkel and Oates. Ooh. Okay. You win. That's a good one. I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> Well, Robin, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Of course, before I let you go, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And where can we find you and how can we support you online and uh, any sites you'd like to promote? Uh, You can find me online at Robin L. Singer on Instagram. Uh, You can purchase Band of Bards on bandofbards.com, either digitally or physically. And if you'd like to follow my writing career through my short stories and my sci-fi novel trilogy, uh, remember to follow Cinnabar Moth Publishing on Twitter. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.